Hey everybody, Stu Smith here going live, taking some questions after a brief discussion as you guys congregate. Um, happy Monday. Hope all is going well. We started this morning with a 6 a.m. workout at 25 degrees, finished at about 8 o'clock. So two hours and 25 degree air makes you want to move a lot. So uh, that is one thing for sure. You got to dress in layers and you just have to keep moving. So, you know, it's, you know, it used to be we would train indoors, you know, for the winter, especially when we're lifting. But we've actually had a lot of fun just acclimating and making the workouts a little harder, to be honest with you. It makes things harder when you are training in the dark and the cold and, um, you know, trying to do things that you would normally do in a warm, you know, weightlifting area, weightlifting room. Um, we still do a lot of calisthenics and cardio anyway, so it's good for for that. And those actually keep you pretty warm in between sets. So it's actually pretty fun. Though I will say the uh, shower after two hours in uh, 25 degree air is always nice. So, I'm still feeling a little chill, but nothing too bad. Going to continue on. Um, so, today's little discussion before we get started with the uh, questions. Um, I always do this towards the last week of the year. And right as we are starting to transition into our winter lift cycle, which starts later this week. Um, we'll probably start officially next week, uh, finish this week off. And uh, as winter, first day of winter is tomorrow, I think, today or tomorrow. Doesn't say on my calendar. Nope, says tomorrow, winter begins. So our winter lift cycle will probably start on the 26th, the day after Christmas. Um, but every year at this time, people are, you know, trying to figure out how to be a little more consistent with their time and regardless of what that goal is could be training you know new year's resolution doesn't have to be all about fitness you know i used to hate resolutions and i still do just because most of them fail by february and the word resolution is out of our vocabulary by february 1st um so I never liked that. I like setting goals. I like trying to build habits. So my advice for anybody who's trying to get started with some new goal is this. Set a goal and then set a time in the day and make that time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is, geared towards accomplishing that goal of yours. <laughs> um, and that way, while you're motivated to do so, you're starting to build a habit. And that's key. While you're in this motivational phase of the first few weeks, which we all are with a new challenge, um, you know, start building those good habits every day. Have something to do. Set that time. And then there's going to be a day, a couple of weeks from now, three weeks, a month maybe, where you're, guess what? You're, mo you're not motivated. You're tired. You're hungry. You don't feel like working out. It's been a long day, but you're going to do it anyway. Or you've had a long, you didn't sleep well and you don't want to get up early and you decide to stay in bed, but then that you go work out anyway. That's when you've e evolved that motivation into consistent time making habits. And that's when habits become discipline. It, it takes that journey for you to create discipline in your life, wherever it is, to go through that little journey. Because there's going to be a day when you don't feel like it, but you do it anyway. That is key. It's not, you know, I, I think life has a way of allowing us to do that process. Because there's many days when you grow up, you don't feel like going to school, but 
you put on your clothes and you go to school anyway. You know, it's, it's very similar. You know, you have to make it part of your day. If you have an eight o'clock school start, that's when you have to be there, right? Same with working out, but you just have to do it on your schedule. You have an eight o'clock workout, get it done. You know, you have to do it before eight o'clock because that's when you go to work, start at six. You don't need a lot. You know, when you're first getting started, it can be very basic. You don't need to join a gym yet. Just start making that time matter. You know, that investment of 20 or 30 minutes at 6 a.m. will get you used to waking up at 530. That will get you used to going to bed a little bit earlier. So that's not painful. You know, so there's all types of steps that you can make to make that an easier process for you. And that's what I'm writing about today. I usually don't do these uh, New Year's resolution articles, and I'm planning on not doing that. But my goal is to make sure that um, I'm just discussing the, the process of time investment, creating a habit, being consistent about that, and then eventually that will evolve into discipline. And that's when you succeed because there's a 20% chance that you will succeed if you start on a New Year's resolution. That's how bad it is. That's like Bud's statistics. 80% will fail. 20% will graduate. So that's that's pretty comparable statistics there. All right, so I'll, I'll start. I'll quit talking start taking some questions and uh, see what we have here. Mikhail, my buddy, he's always here. Good to see you, sir. Um, have you found out what date exactly you and your guys start to win our left cycle? Yes. We are actually going to play around with some lifts this week, um, adding in some deadlifts. Like today we added in hang cleans and power cleans. Um, instead of like dumbbell exercises, did those with barbells. Um, and then probably Friday, instead of a beach run, we're going to be lifting. So things are starting to change this week. But our official winter lift cycle will start on Monday. This is what we're doing on Monday. So right now we're finishing the last week of the fall cycle. So Raymond beats me with the temperature, it appears. Six degrees Fahrenheit here. Today, yes, that was a scoop of mental toughness this morning. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, I think 25 degrees was a scoop of mental toughness. It, it sucked. It was not fun. It was a little windy, too, so that sucks even more. But, yeah, six is pretty hardcore. I think we had one year or no one workout last year that reached single digits. And uh, that was brutal. I won't lie. That that wasn't fun. But you dress right. You got gloves. You got a watch cap on. You got a jacket, a couple layers. You can crush that. Now, I like that. I just got that winter lift cycle in the email. Look forward to putting it to work. Yeah. You know what? That'll be fun. We'll we'll kind of do it together. I'm I am doing that again this year together. I created this last year with some alterations and um, put it in. And this year I've made a few changes to it where we're going to start off the first four weeks of the cycle will be more higher repetition, hypertrophy level type training. The middle four weeks will be um kind of a moderate you know eight to ten rep level lifts and then the last four weeks would be five and under so it'd be a little heavier so each four week progression of the winter lift cycle will go from higher reps medium reps lower reps heavier weight so it was just a uh, something that uh worked really well last year as we transitioned out of the fall before we started really getting heavy and uh, it was perfect. Everybody put on mass, everybody got stronger and we were still able to maintain some running with about anywhere from 15 to 20 miles a week of cardio in there as well. 
Any tips on calisthenics leg workouts? I got a lot of tips. In fact, I got so many tips. I put them in this book, Calisthenics and Cardio. Whole bunch of leg days in here. In fact, two to three days a week are leg days. So one thing that we like to do with this one, I call it run and leg PT. Or you can do a bike if running is not your thing. Um, is uh, you can do like five minute run or bike cardio events, followed by squats, lunges, jumps, step ups. I like to add farmer walks in there too, where you just put something in your hand that's heavy and you walk. Try to stay straight, one hand, and then when that grip gives out, put in the other one, walk back to where you started. Um, those are good, you know, ways to uh, work the legs, work the core, work your cardio, and just repeat that. <clears throat> you know, we actually do it with uh, on a track with uh, quarter mile and half mile sets with squats and lunges and frog hops in between. Those are uh, usually a little more dynamic and pretty fun, pretty fun little workout. Not sure what you're referring to, Facebook user. That takes effort. It all takes effort. Life is all about effort. You can choose to go through life and not make any efforts, but that would kind of suck. You get nowhere. Come on, man. Of course it takes effort. Um, hey, Stu, I'm trying to bulk and build mass. I'm slim 165 right now. How can I get the most calories in throughout the day while also working 10 hour days? You know, you got to be quick. You got to be smart about your calories. I would suggest going to work and taking a big thing of peanut butter with you to work. And every, I guess, in between meals, take a scoop of peanut butter. Maybe two scoops if you want, you know, by the end of the day, have three, maybe four scoops of peanut butter and you will add anywhere from 500 to 800 calories to your caloric intake. That has been the magic thing for most of my guys and myself back in the day when I was trying to gain weight to gain weight. Peanut butter, I used to do peanut butter and banana sandwiches or just a scoop of peanut butter. And I will tell you this, I like peanut butter a lot. And I was trying to lose weight just because I got a little heavy over a winter lift cycle, trying to rip it up a little bit. And, um, you know, I got my clipboard out and just started keeping track of everything that came in as um, far as calories are concerned. And I noticed I had that scoop of peanut butter twice a day. Uh, one after breakfast, one after lunch, sometimes even one before bed with a big glass of milk. <laughs> oh, that's good, man. That's some good taste right there. And I was looking at an extra 600 calories a day because of that. And then once I stopped my peanut butter, I started losing weight again. So, you know, it, it put me in a, I was, I was not gaining, I was not losing. So it kept me at that like equilibrium, like all the calories in were being accounted for by calories out at the end of the day. So I was just maintaining weight. But when I stopped eating that peanut butter scoop, I had 600 calorie deficit a day. Then by the end of the week, I was burnt. I was losing about a pound, pound and a half every week. And then 10 weeks later, I'm at my goal. So that makes a huge difference in putting on some mash. If you want to put it this way, if you want to be big, basically you have to eat big. There's no other way to do it. Alex from Texas, have a great week yourself. Um, let's see. Joe says, how restricted is the breaststroke kick when used with the CSS? Are you risking failing a PST? Or getting kicked out of the program if your CSS is breaststroke oriented. You know what? As a rule, there is no written rule saying you cannot use breaststroke kick or scissor kick or dolphin kick for the combat swimmer stroke. 
until I see that rule written, I will stop teaching all three. Because I've had guys do dolphin kicks for their for their kick. I've had guys do scissor kicks. That's what I prefer. And I've had guys do breaststroke kicks. And they all get through buds. So somewhere along the line, you may have an instructor that says you can't do breaststroke kick with the CSS. And that's a lie. Well, I think where that confusion is being made, I shouldn't call it a lie. It's not understanding the process is where that confusion is being made is when you swim with scuba fins, you cannot use a breaststroke. Now, it's not because of a rule you can't. It's just stupid to use a breaststroke kick with a pair of fins on because you're going to go not very far or very fast when you do a kick with a breaststroke looking like a frog. Our legs just aren't made that way to do it quickly and fast. So little flutter kicks, um, big scissor kick, little flutter kicks, dolphin kick with fins all work really well. Breaststroke does not. So I think that is where the confusion is being made. But you may find an instructor that doesn't know any better and enforces that during the CSS test. Just, you know, my, my recommendation is get to know what that test is and how he tests and what he allows. And that's what you do because they hold the keys to the community that you were trying to get into or find another recruiting district or another recruiter and probably will have a different um, person testing you. Okay. Any advice for weak swimmers? Um, you got to get in the pool. I mean, period. Yes, there's some exercises you can do on land that make your kicks better and your pulls better, but that's just working out. Um, my advice is... Uh, Probably if you're weak at swimming, you're probably also weak at treading. So read this article here. It's about a CSS breakdown and also has some treading in it. I just put a article link in the um, comment section. But I also have a CSS. One, if you go to Google, CSS One Stop Shop, Stu Smith, and it is an article that I wrote that has just about every useful video, podcast, and um, article with embedded videos in them about the CSS and very common mistakes that people make. Uh, go through that, watch the videos in there, you know, go to, um, my Instagram, my Facebook, or I'm sorry, my, my YouTube. Um, you know, every Tuesday at 9 a.m., I do a live Q&A with CSS critiques. So send a video in to me of you swimming, and I can critique it for you. Tell you what you're doing right, what you're doing wrong. But yes, there's a lot of advice for weak swimmers. I would say... Watch some videos and practice. And then take some videos and compare your videos to someone else who's doing it properly and see where you need to make those changes. I have had countless people come to me here in Maryland and just you know swim with us for the day. And they were self-taught by videos. And when they jumped in the pool, swam their first 50, I'm watching them. I'm like, damn, that looks pretty good. Because I've never been coached it before. I just watch videos. So it can be done. You just got to put in the time. Just like when I started this uh, conversation about setting a time and be consistent with it, you have to swim just about every day if you want to get better at swimming. Period. Because there's technique that's involved and there's conditioning that's involved. And chances are, just goes to, I don't even have to assume this, I know this. If you suck at swimming, you are not good at technique and you're not in swimming shape. It doesn't matter if you're in great running shape. Swimming shape is a completely different animal. You cannot apply your conditioning of running 
to a degree you can, to swimming. Two different animals. So, yeah, you might be in great running shape, but you're going to have to get in swimming shape, too, if you're a weak swimmer. So be patient. Give yourself some time. All right, Marcus. He's in college right now. Will join SF after graduation. Do you suggest me buy the new or old tactical fitness athlete? Um, I mean, the old ones are just different. You know, it, they're just different choreographies of the same exercises that I do this year. You know, each year I come up with different programs. They work. They work fine. It just depends. It just gives you more variety. So you can take two years to prepare and have two different years of programming that are similar because they're in a system of the seasonal tactical fitness periodization model, but they're a little bit different choreography. So they're not, you don't get stale and you can move on. So my advice is, you know, if you're trying to go Army SF, Go with this combo. This is a really good combo right here. And by the way, guess what my number one, two, three, four, five best-selling programs are here at Stu Smith Fitness. I'm going to put all three of them up right here. Here's one, two, and three. Actually, FBI first. FBI fitness test is first, and then these two are second and third, usually tied. Sometimes the Army PFT is a little faster or is a little higher. I will say this, a four that is just beat the Navy SEAL versions is this one. Air Force Special Warfare is now topping uh, the Navy SEAL program. So all my Navy SEAL programs are battling for fourth and fifth with the... Uh, Air Force PJs, but it just goes to show you more people want to be FBI agents. More people want to be in the Army than in the Air Force and Navy special ops programs, just the way it is. You know, you're going to have a lot more people go Army than you will Navy spec ops and Air Force spec ops. So, um, so that's what I would suggest if you are trying to do it. But then, yeah, if you want a full year of training, sure. You got spring. You have the winter. You have the fall. You know, you can do those. Or you can do the other versions that are fall and winter, spring, summer. That's not them. I think I just mailed them away. Gave them away last last week. <clears throat> but anyway, there, there's plenty of options in there for you. Stu, this is phrased weirdly, but what com commonalities would you say exist among the most dedicated SOF candidates that you have come through your program? What set them apart from the rest of the group? That's not phrased weirdly. That's just a great question. Um, I would say... They crushed the workouts, were kind of setting the standard in the workouts, would find ways to push others in the workouts, whether that was, hey, I'm going to go run the time mile and a half. Anybody want to go with me? And then nobody raises their hands. They're like, come on, somebody go with me. Right. And so it's, you know, you can do those by yourself or you can do them as a group. And a lot of times they form these groups. Um, push others, pushing themselves while they do it. Um, then on their own, they are smart and they add in some other training later in the day that is addressing their weakness, whether that is going in the pool, swimming longer, treading longer. They are putting on a ruck, rucking later. You know, after the workout, they're doing a second lift if they need to put on some mass or something and just trying to stay strong. Um, oh, sorry. My uh, thing fell off there. 
Um, so there's a lot of really good, um, I should say like, something like extra credit. You know, they're always just doing a little bit more than everybody else. That's what I say. And then they not only reach the standards, they exceed the standards. That's that's where like they're not happy with you know a nine minute run and a nine minute swim. You know, they want an eight thirty run and an eight minute swim. You know, those are nine minutes and nine minutes are fine. They're well under the standard, but exceeding the standard is the standard for the for that group. And they want to win. They want to win events. And they also want to be a good team player. And you can see that starting to form with the group as they do that because they organize like second workouts later in the day that is going to address maybe going for a long ruck on the beach you know, on a day when we didn't run that much. But they're smart about it. And they usually ask me, hey, Stu, we're doing a second workout. What should we add to today's workout that won't mess up tomorrow's workout? Because that's that's the question you have to ask when you're starting to supplement more running or more swimming or more lifting into these daily programs because they're they're hard programs as they are. But yes, you could do more. And that's going to depend on your ability to also recover. So Marcus asks, uh, how can he join us? Um, well, we're in Maryland. If you can make it to Maryland, you can join us. There are 6 a.m. workouts Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. on Saturday. Uh, and they're free. Free training. There you go. Can't argue with the price. You guys give, do give me ideas to write about, though. So, you know, everybody wins. I get ideas as a coach. I see things that need coaching, whether it's a technique or it's a, a strategy for folks. Um, and then I write about those coaching experiences and training experiences. So everybody wins. And I don't work out by myself. My NSW mentor was unable to answer, and Googling hasn't helped. Is Bud's prep now combined with Bo, and together they make up eight weeks? My question is, why does my answer matter to you? If I told you it was six weeks, or if I told you it was eight weeks, does that matter? Yeah, I think they quit calling it. Bud's orientation, or they call, they quit calling it prep, and now it's all Bud's orientation. I don't know, but who cares? They changed the title of that pre-Bud stuff, you know, like I change underwear. So who cares what it's called? Who cares how long it is? Just know you got to do it, right? I think that's one of those questions that in the grand scheme of your training, doesn't really matter what the answer is. It's just something you got to do. It's kind of like asking, you know, hey, on that four mile timed run, is it is it low tide or high tide? Who cares? I mean, that does make a difference, but you may have a four mile timed run that's not the best conditions. You know, being able to train on concrete as well as sandy beaches, as well as low tide, hard pack sand all three you're gonna see so practice them so continued on this is a better question uh do you have any tips on swimming without goggles do you keep your eyes open the entire time you know what i do i squint so um and i don't look forward so when you're swimming what I see a lot of people doing is they swim like this, right? And their eyes are just getting pounded with water. So one, keep your head down and then squint so you can just see the black line on the bottom. And that's all you need to do. So um, 
Yeah, but and and then when you kick off the wall, make sure your head is down because if your head's up and that water is like going right into your eyes, that really sucks. And you don't want to hit anybody going that fast because you are really fast when you kick off that wall. So keep your head down, squint, and you'll be fine. It's not fun, but you don't have to do it a whole lot of times. Um, you do have to take a couple of tests without your mask on. And that would be, um, you know, the drown proofing test, the underwater 50 meter swim test. What else? A life saving test. Yeah, not tying you, you can, you have a mask on. So pool comp, you, you start off with a mask, but eventually you will lose your mask. So. Oh, well, thank you, QTF. Appreciate it. So Aiden asks, okay, uh, 5'11", 145, how much weight do I need to put on? Uh, significant. That's pretty light. Though I will say this, my son in eighth grade was 6'2", 145. So he was tall and skinny. And then by the time he graduated high school, he was 6'3", 6'4", and 200. So it takes some time to start putting on mass, depending on how old you are. Because the younger you are, um, the uh, um, often the harder it is to put on mass. It's just the way it is. If you're in your mid-teens, it, you can eat all you want. It's really hard to put on mass. It's just, uh, it's called being a hard gainer. So a good thing that you you want to add is add more carbs to your diet. Not crap carbs like sugar cakes, but, uh, you know, bananas, apples. Um, you can do some uh, instant breakfast. That's a good addition. I think the tr thing that got my son to put on mass was he'd have an instant breakfast in the morning and he'd have an instant breakfast at night and all it's milk, milk powder. And you can see there's a lot of carbs in it, but there's some good protein in it too. Like, you know, 20 grams of protein. The problem with being a hard gainer is that, uh, you don't process protein the same way a more mature body would like in your twenties. And you don't really put on a lot of mass with added protein, so you need more carbs. So I'm not sure what this means. Go to vlog. Yeah, I think I think someone needs to be blocked because I don't understand what you're saying. And that seems potentially spamish. All right, so Mikhail, tell me. What your weird question is, but the spec ops units value people knowing more languages. I'm fluent in three, but I'm wondering if I should spend spare time learning more. No, I think three is sufficient. However, you know, depending on your country and depending on the types of, I guess, situations that you may be involved in, um, you may see a need for another language, whether that is Russian or Ukrainian, you know, could be many things. You know, NATO is going to be dealing with a lot of stuff here probably in the next five years, um, probably leaning more towards that direction. But the fact, you know, three is great. You know, you'll be an asset knowing three languages. So absolutely, we value people who know languages, especially if you're doing foreign internal defense missions, which often happen. Someone shows up at Buds without any glaring weaknesses. What usually gets guys to quit? Hmm. I've seen all types. Everything. Anxiety gets it. I've seen a guy who had no weaknesses that was crushing everything and the night before Hell Week, before it even started, he decided this was not the path he wanted to take. Didn't fail anything. In fact, it was top 5%. 
and decided he wanted to do something else. Said he was felt the anxiety of what he was about to go through get to him. Um, yes, chafing sucks. I didn't see many people quit because of chafing. By the time you chafe, you're kind of in it, you know, and I remember my whole week chafing was just brutal, but it never made me want to quit. It sucked. Every time I got wet, it burned. You know, it's just, it just sucked. Um, never made me want to quit though. So I, I wouldn't say chafing's that big a deal. Cold, yes. Being cold all the time, absolute horrible. Um, tired, uncomfortable is a big one too. Cold, wet, sandy. And if it's like two in the morning and you don't see an end to the day, let's say you're not in hell week and you're out that late anyway, and you know the next day starts at six and you're still not done at two, that messes with you pretty good knowing that oh good i get to go back and sleep for two hours and go back and do this again you know you can look at that as a negative or you can look at it as a positive and say Ooh, i get to go eat get rested come back do this again get fed come back ready to go so it's all mindset really if if you have no glaring weaknesses everything else is pure mindset whether or not you're going to make it or not So, Mr. Smith, can the elliptical bike or stale climber replace running, or should I just add running every other day? I'm trying to drop weight for the police academy. Um, yeah, it absolutely can. In fact, I would suggest this. Where a lot of people go wrong with just running is they just eventually end up running too much. And now they have overuse injuries caused by running. So shin splints, foot pain, fasciitis, tendonitis, you know, pulled hamstrings, you know, whatever the injury is, um, very typical when you run too much. So what I would suggest is have your cardio time laid out, and I would do at least an hour of cardio a day, and two-thirds of that cardio is non-impact cardio. So you can run for 20 minutes and you do bike, elliptical, stair stepper for 40 minutes. But, you know, that's just part of it for conditioning. And it's a good way to burn calories, but you should be doing calisthenics and lifting too in there to burn more calories. And you'll see a sufficient caloric drop. And then the other side of that equation is making sure you're not overeating and adding too many calories to a point where now you're either maintaining weight or gaining weight. So there's a caloric deficit that needs to occur in your day if you're trying to drop weight for the academy. And cardio is a great way to burn calories, but so is every other activity. My suggestion would be just to do it so you don't get injured prior to it with some non-impact cardio. Hey, Stu, thanks for all you do. You ever thought about writing a book more about mental toughness in life? Um, you know, I've thought about it. Um, I think there's a lot out there on that stuff. You know, I've written a lot of articles about it. In fact, you know, just like I have that combat swimmer stroke one-stop shop, I have one on mental toughness, too. So mental toughness, let me see if I can find it here real quick. Um, so by the way, all I do is I go to Google here, mental toughness, one stop shop landing page. There you go. So yeah, pops up on the Google machine, mental toughness, the one stop shop, one stop landing page for answers. So this is a pretty good article. Check this out because it is loaded with articles, podcasts, like a podcast talks about a progress that builds mental toughness. Um, yeah, I think there's at least a dozen articles and another half dozen podcasts that I did on the topic. So check that out if you're looking for more information. But I haven't really thought about writing a book on it, to be honest. I think there's enough out there. 
you know, not saying that it's saturated with mental toughness experts, but, um, yeah, I just haven't given a thought, written a lot of articles about it. Maybe I can combine all my articles and make it a, some form of book. I don't know. I completed the PRS course at Fort Campbell, but got the Ranger School at Benning and got dropped in land nab. My feet were toasted, wasn't able to meet the allotted time mark. Any advice for feet conditioning? Yeah, that's a tough one, man. Army feet conditioning, that's another breed of special toughness. Um, you know, something that, I mean, I used to do as a kid was just walk around barefoot all the time. Can't really do that a whole lot in real life. Um, but yeah, you do need to get your feet tougher and make sure your, your boots fit properly. It's, it's more of a fitting issue. I wear two pair of socks. I wear a very thin pair of like nylon socks that go up against my skin, almost like pantyhose, slippery, right? And then I put the regular army or navy wool combat boot sock over that. So now my skin has a layer of protection against anything that tends to form a hot spot um, and things like that. And if you know you're getting hot spots, you know, a lot of people put some kind of layer on their foot inside that, like duct tape or, you know, something, something that just, I wouldn't use duct tape personally, but there's some skin, like second skin that you can get to put over hot spots might be helpful for you, but really you just got to put on the boots and start moving and make sure you break in your boots properly. One of the ways we used to break in our boots back when you needed to break in boots, like the old jungle boots was we would uh, get them wet, like for like soak them for like 20 or 30 minutes. And then we would put them on and let them dry around our feet um, for the next couple of hours. You know, we do this like on a Saturday and just walk around in them. <clears throat> and uh, that was very helpful. You know, that kind of molds them to your feet a little bit. So that's something to consider. Um, yeah, give that a shot. But, uh, you know, there's some Army guys that probably have another dozen helpful foot care tips compared to me. Um, I tell you this, though. I was wet and sandy every day at Bud's. I think there were five days out of six months that I was not wet. Um, and uh, I never got a blister, mainly because I had two pairs of socks on. That little thin rayon, Nate nylon polyester fake cotton no cotton sock underneath the cotton wool blend sock those are that's gonna save you I'm telling you that's the that's the key possibly done question do you think there's any benefit in actually visiting coronado before joining training there just to be just to get a feel for the area and what it would be no i don't think that's stupid I mean, I did. I I went to Coronado twice before, um, before going to Buds. One was a rugby trip on spring break, and we were in California in San Diego, so we just went out to Coronado to check it out. There were four guys on the rugby team that all went to Buds, um, and then um. And then I went out there again for mini buds, which they call SOAS now. So I think that's helpful. You know, you just kind of learn the lay of the land and, you know, where everything is. And it, it just, so when you get there, your brain's not 100% in overwhelm new uh, environment mode, which happens, you know, to a brain. So um, it's something to consider. If you can't, it's not going to be the breaking factor. Oh, dang it. Ugh. Hang on. Sorry. 
lost my uh looks like i lost my camera and my audio hopefully it comes back on you guys hear me yet uh, camera died Come on now. Come back. All right, we back? I think my camera's still dead. So, sorry folks. I'm not sure what happened to my camera, but it is broken. That kind of sucks. Maybe it'll come back any second. If I can't get it going back in the next uh, minute, I'm going to shut it down. 